We have uh, some time for questions. Again, we'll have the, the roving mic. Please keep your questions, comments brief to um, enable others to participate. And I understand there's a bit of feedback on the mic, so if you can keep the mic about six to eight inches away, I think it'd be better, um, better audio. So uh, we have Ben. Yes, sir, you can start. Yes, uh, I'm Ian Blue. I'm an administrative lawyer, and I have uh, been assisting the Lake Ridge Citizens for Clean Water. Uh, with respect to Josh and Carmelo's points, that <laughs> municipalities are unable to control some of these fill operations in their uh, jurisdictions. There's one <clears throat> point that I think should be made, and that is there is no obligation on the part of the municipality to issue the permit in the first place. That, whether or not to issue the permit, is a discretionary action, and if it is uh, decided in the municipality's discretion that it will not issue a uh, fill certificate, that decision cannot be touched. It's very simple. If you do that enough, then you're going to get provincial action to get the controls you want. My name is George Duncan. I'm an environmental consultant and a qualified person. For the first half of my career, I spent my 20 years in the back room of the lab analyzing soils and waters. For the second half of my 40-year career, I spent out in the field taking those samples and sending them into the lab to analyze them. The draft guidelines specify that a representative sample shall be submitted to the laboratory. That's my problem because in order to get a representative sample of masses amount of soil, you're talking samples in tons, mm -hmm. rather than what we send to the lab, which is a small jar with about 100 grams in the jar. That would be nice if the lab analyzed all of that, but the lab takes about half a teaspoonful. Mm -hmm. And so we're now running into situations where two samples, three feet apart, have totally different numbers. So when we talk about contaminated soil, as a chemist, I'm saying, what are you talking about? I'd like some comment. Thank you. I, I, I recall I used to be a consultant at Gardner Lee, and uh, I remember many years ago, that would have been in the, in the early 90s, running into that problem. And I kind of was hoping it was resolved by this point. <laughs> I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't been involved in contaminated sites and contaminated soils, but that is absolutely a big issue. I, I honestly, I was, I mean, yeah, I was hoping it, <laughs> that someone had geostatistically had solved that in the last 10, 15 years. So that is a big problem. I, I just had a point to that. Um, so uh, uh, in many of my presentations, when I speak to municipalities about clean versus contaminated, I always go back to that there's no uh, definition that the ministry does provide. Um, however, just recently I found um, a reference to contaminated soil provided by the ministry and it was in a um, uh, environmental compliance approval for the um, green soils operation down at the waterfront, you know, the port lands. And so they, they indicated that if anything was above table three, that it was, con it was considered contaminated soils. But some, but some municipalities, I know Clarington in their previous bylaw might still be in their current one, um, they said that contaminated, indicated contaminated soils were uh, soils that had anything uh, above the ambient soil quality of, of the receiving site. So that's, that's the problem, I think, is that it's very vague. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Hi, my name is Beth Mazaros and I come from Clarington. Um, my question is in regards to East Gwillimberry's uh, new bylaw and to Carmela who did such a great and amazing uh, comment on everything for us. Uh, thank you for that, Carmela. Uh, why do you feel 
East Gloomberry has the most comprehensive bylaw. And also, um, when we're thinking about, about fill sites, one of the things that's lacking is enforcement. There's lots of talk, but there's no, and, and a lot of the words are, are um, promote, recommend, suggest. But there's no words like enforce. Um, I did hear Glenn, I was so excited to hear you say, um, Regulations, thank you, Donna. Um, that, th those kind of words we need to hear so that we begin to feel that something is actually going to happen. Thank you. So uh, Beth, one of the things that I found um, that was important to note in East Columbia's bylaw in their operational guideline, it's acknowledged um, how the uh, the tables in the MOE, um, in the MOE uh, guidelines, how they are the MOE standards, how they are used normally in for brownfields, and so they they indicate that um, uh, that the the soil guidelines are to be used how they are normally used for the brownfield regulation or with regard with regard to that. So, for example. Um, uh, if, when you're importing soils into a particular site, uh, you have to apply the, how the ministry uses those regulations for brownfields to the, to also to the receiving site. So for example, if the site was clean in the brownfields regulation, you're only allowed to import Table 1 soils unless you have some sort of environmental assessment. And so they acknowledge that, and, and, uh, and I find that maybe that's not always acknowledged in certain bylaws. And the other thing, the big thing for me was the amount of testing. So for, for brownfields, once you've cleaned it up and you are gonna be bringing soils back in to backfill or whatever you're going to do, um, it's very specific the number of tests you are supposed to do for the, the, the source of those soils. So for example, one test for every 160 cubic meters, which isn't a lot, it's just a few grams, but still it's something. And so, uh, for example, if you had, so if you apply those same kind of standards to a receiving site, so if you have 200 trucks coming in per day, and you're doing one in every 160 cubic meters, you're going to, you know, you're gonna get probably a good 20 samples that you need to take. But in some cases, what we've been seeing is there's zero, there's none that are taken. I don't see how a clean site should receive any less um, sh sh should receive any less protection than a brownfield site that was previously or could have been previously contaminated and now is receiving soil. So I don't, I don't understand that. So I think I, I appreciate that the Terrebro document does acknowledge that. And then the final thing that I um, appreciate about East Columbia's uh, bylaw is that they uh, promote or they incorporate peer reviews by their own um, consultant, their own qualified person to oversee all the uh, source site reports that are coming in because as we have seen and as you saw in those management slides I had which I went through quickly uh, that that is a key thing even sometimes when QPs are on site the the, the uh, source site reports are not um, they, they're lacking they're insufficient they're inadequate they're incomplete those kind of things so if you have somebody else having another eye to it I, I think that that's important Hello, I'm, I'm Greg Locke, and I'm Chair of Concerned Citizens of King Township. And I just want to really uh, applaud all of you on, on your presentations today. I thought they were all quite excellent. Um, and I know we know each other a little bit. And uh, you'll know that I'm, I'm, uh, I, I can be known to ask loaded questions. And I'm going to ask you one today, if anything, because uh, <laughs> I want to get the discussion going uh, in, uh, in, in a slightly more political direction. Because as you know, uh, as a concerned citizen organization, we've been closely watching some of the activities in southern Ontario, and particularly the Tottenham Airport, because it's so close to us, and of course the Scugach situation. And we've been waiting for uh, municipalities to realize, and by the way, I'm talking specifically right now with regard to aerodromes, uh, that we've been waiting for municipalities to realize that their fill bylaws are, are quite adequate in order to be applied, and we believe that. But we also can have seen that the federal government, provincial government, and various ministries have been very careful in their response about whether or not, in fact, they have that authority. But we've also seen that, you know, pretty much short of just saying, yes, you have that authority, there's been multiple agencies saying the municipalities really should enforce their fill bylaws. And what I want to ask you is, is from your opinion, because you're all very involved in, in all of this from various perspectives, can a municipality afford not to enforce their fill bylaws with regards to aerodromes, considering what we know today? That's my question. <laughs> You're the pro. Well, I think a municipality um, has a responsibility 
to protect the environment and, and a responsibility to their citizens. And if so, uh, if the federal government is not acknowledging, well, they've stated that that is not their concern, that quality of materials or, or a fill effect to the environment when they're with, with their NRX Act, with their legislation, that that's not a concern, then it, then it falls to the regulating authority that has jurisdiction over that. And the municipality has jurisdiction over regard to the environment and to their citizens. So absolutely, they, they, can afford, they can't afford not to enforce their bylaws because nobody else is looking at that. They are the only ones who are looking at that quality. So absolutely, yep. I mean, just from a, from a groundwater point of view, yeah, obviously the, mm -hmm. you know, cleaning up groundwater is expensive, it takes a long time, and often you just can't even do it. So yeah, certainly you, you don't want to go down that path if you don't have to. I mean, it's an ugly path. Is there, you know, there's certainly more awareness of that in the last 20, 30 years than previous. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Rene de Vries. I'm with Tetra Tech, Consulting Engineers. And uh, QP, I've worked for 25 years in uh, Ontario, testing soil, mostly on the side of uh, private landowners and generators of fill, sometimes contaminated, sometimes not. Uh, we're also involved with Waterfront Toronto Soil Recycling uh, Project. Um, I made that point to uh, uh, Dolly Goyette, uh, and I agree with you, Carmela, that it, the solution is relatively simple. Uh, specify frequencies for uh, testing that for fill that, uh, that is moved. Uh, I know this going to, is going to create f uh, pushback from landowners because of cost, but that will create the level playing field. So, uh, yeah, that was not a question, but uh, support, I guess, from a QP in the field. I appreciate that. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm Debbie Schaefer. I'm a counselor in King Township. Uh, Steve, my question is directed to you. Um, being absolutely a layperson, um, you know, my eyes were just popping out looking at all the maps you were showing and the data that's available. Tell me, how can, how can we use that data that is available? to help us with this problem. I assume there is some way we could use it. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. The, I mean, there's, you know, the numerous ways. I mean, I just showed a couple of, I mean, a regional examples. So the, these clean fill, fill sites are very site specific and frequently there, there isn't data on the site itself. But if you were, if you, you know, had, if there were best management practices in place and people were going to say, okay, let's evaluate this site as to its, um, you know, its uh, viability to accept clean fill, you could, you could take a look at the, the data that we have. So look at the subsurface geology or the soils, low permeability, high permeability, how deep is the water table, um, you know, what's the drainage characteristics of the site, you know, are there going to be issues with, with um, putting low permeability material, restricting recharge. So you can get a lot of insight just from, a, from, a, you know, from, from what we've assembled. And then if, if, you know, if you're lucky enough, I mean, we've, we've also stored on the order of 5,000 consulting reports. So in the past, consulting reports come in to municipalities, CAs, they're active during a planning application. They're in the drawers, they're up in the planning department, then they're in the basement, then they're out in the warehouse, and then they're in the shredder, and that information is lost. And what we've tried to do is, you know, uh, scan those reports, inventory them, give them coordinates, map them. And so, you know, again, if you're lucky enough to have reports close to where your site is being investigated, that information is available. So any of the partner agencies that you saw listed on my slide, you know, in, in King Township, the region of York has access to the information, Lake Simcoe Conservation Authority, TRCA, and all the, all the agencies have the database on their, in, their, in their shops and make use of it to varying degrees. Well, uh, thank you very much. We were running out of time and you never stand between people and lunch. Uh, that's the uh, number one rule of being a mayor. Um, but there is a couple of good things that happened today is uh, when Steve uh, put his slideshow up about the boogeyman, uh, my picture didn't appear, so. Uh, um, but, but one comment on uh, municipal bylaws. And uh, two years ago we had a meeting right in this building 
uh, when the Lake Ridge site was being uh, talked about. And I took uh, huge heat from the citizens about charge them under the bylaw. If that happened, they'd still be dumping today and uh, we'd still be going in court, uh, uh, getting fines. We need a bigger solution. If every of the 440 municipalities set out a bylaw, you're going to have confusion, you're going to have different practices, industry will be uh, wondering, you know, what rules do I follow? Some municipalities will welcome this. Uh, with uh, small limits, other ones will ban it with strict limits. Uh, you know, industry uh, needs, you know, clear, established, well thought out scientific, uh, you know, reasons. And they also need to understand the effects on citizens. So, fill bylaws are important and everyone's been renewing them. But that is not going to solve what we're talking about today. Um, they do not have the weight. And uh, from a legal community, the best case you want to go to court in is one where you have uh, different court rulings and interpretations all over the place. Uh, because how could a judge make any decision on that? So I uh, just want to clarify that. Uh, municipalities are working very hard um, you know, to try to address this. Uh, but I think we're here today for a, a greater purpose than that. So I thank all the presenters. Uh, these are individuals, uh, most of them on their volunteer time, uh, you know, that have been doing this work for countless of months and have been a great resource uh, to our municipality. So I want to thank you very much, and please accept this small token of commercial fill. <laughs> Thank you.